Welcome back to another episode of the Multifamily Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Antrim, and I have a very exciting guest for you today. Mukan Chopra is a serial entrepreneur and investor. He was activated early with Groupon as a chief revenue officer, also an early investor in Slack. And, you know, he brings this really interesting fundamental approach to investments and the application to business efficiency for multifamily. We discussed what really is a company, right? What is the primary purpose it serves? Uh, he breaks this down in the simplest form. And we explored questions like, how do we, do, do executives even want to find efficiencies in the business? And if they do, what are those roles? How do those roles play out today? Uh, should they exist the way that they exist, right? So for example, do I need a head of marketing or do I really just want leads? And so using first principles, thinking through some of those things. And he goes into later in the episode around how the most valuable companies in the world today have data, own their data, can access their data, and can unlock their data with AI. We go into really the turning data into cash and then where not to use AI. Right, that's an interesting perspective, and uh, it's just really more than just a conversation. It's a master class on how to build and think through enterprise value in a business today. So, with that, uh, have a listen. Great interview with Mukan Chopra. All right, so here we are. We're talking about something different. When to not use AI? Should we start there? Yeah. Uh- right, actually, you know what? Let me pause, pump the brakes a little bit because. Some of our audience, our viewers, listeners may have not had the opportunity to share time with you. Let's pull back and talk about your background a little bit. Sure. Um, so Patrick, I um, am a recent, uh, I've had a recent entry to sort of the multifamily industry. Um, I've been an entrepreneur, uh, kind of an entrepreneur born out of hubris, <laughs> I think, of, of some, some probably poor career decisions I made when I was younger. Um, so I'm Canadian of Indian origin. I went to school there. I did a couple grad degrees um, in uh, in Canada and in Paris. Um, and I ended up um, doing a lot of work around econometrics, measurement, and mm. sorts of things that were more management science oriented. Um, this led me to some some really cool experiences in tech, um, including I was really fortunate to be part of the um, senior leadership team on the on the revenue side. Um, of Groupon when that company, right in around when that company was going public, mm. um, which people forget about now, was the largest tech IPO after Google at the time. So we were actually before Facebook. Um, it was $20 billion. Um, and then I had a bunch of businesses in between, something in the healthcare space, um, and a lot of stuff that was called, at the time, big data. <laughs> right? Sure. Um, so, you know, AI, as we call it now, and I think a lot of the the excitement around AI, um, when we look at the likes of ChatGPT and the large language models, um, a lot of it is really an, an interface layer or, or sort of a, a, U, a UI change. And I think um, the actual like machinations of how to use uh, models to make decisions consistently have actually pre-existed for, for a super long time. Um, and it's often been... Um, useful to to um, have programmatic decision making functions whenever you're dealing with large volumes of data, short decision making windows, um, and things that are repetitive enough um, for it to make sense. So, there was a business that I was that you know we just sold. Um, well, not we. Uh, I was I was chief revenue officer of maybe 2012 called Granify, and Granify was venture funded in Canada. Um, I'm now an LP in a number of these venture funds sold for 80 million cash. What Granify did was Granify did um, e-commerce uh, checkout um, optimization. So it would determine when somebody was coming to an e-commerce store and uh, then not likely to buy because sure. they got pants in their cart or whatever, but now they're like, oh, these look expensive. So then you shoot them an offer at the sort of right time. So that's the sort of stuff that's been termed AI in the past. Um, and and I, I think that you know, right now there's there's quite a lot of, you know, hype in the media um, because the, you know, chatbot interface has made this stuff more accessible. So it's in many cases a solution sort of looking for a problem. Um, mm-hmm. 
so I've been working in this space and and actually you know my day to day operating business has been using conversational agents as well. But um, suddenly people think AI is great at making decisions. Um, you know when you when you look at the fundamentals of what a large language model actually is, a large language model is just a token input output mechanism, right? It just says um, uh, the cat jumped over, and then you leave it blank and it says the dog. It just looks for the most logical sequence. That doesn't mean it's reasoning. It just means that it's making something come out that looks plausible. So these conversational interfaces left in isolation are prone to error, prone to hallucinations. Um, um, many of them, unless they're attached to a knowledge repository that is relevant in your business, uh, can actually be pretty damaging if you're sort of like going off of what ChatGPT says in a, in a raw sense. And I'm, you know, since I've been working in this space and there's a lot of excitement, I'm, I'm getting 10, 20, um, probably requests a month without exaggeration from, you know, folks that we work with or connected to who are multifamily operators who are looking for a reason to use it. And probably nine times out of 10, I, my response is please do not use AI for that. Sure. Or do not try to. Yeah. And speaking of the conversational AI and, and what is um, where, you know, like you mentioned, it's been, you know, we've been doing uh, machine learning and, and big data and and uh, running programs uh, way, way back. Um, now that the UI, ChatGPT, made it easy to converse and, and basically program, because that's what they're doing when they're putting something in there, they're essentially a programmer. Yes. I, I'm always, I'm really fascinated, even in the work that we do, it's like how the people that are doing the work now have the ability to basically program with conversation. Mm -hmm. But going back into your background, you were involved in Slack yep. and, and they had some big initiatives around conversations and data and things like that. Take us, take us through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the insight that, um, it, it's, it's not much of an insight, right? Like it's like way easier to, to talk to someone and be like, hey man, hand me a burrito, then go on to uh, an e-commerce website or download the Grubhub app or the Groupon app or, or whatever is going to deliver it to you, Uber Eats. Um, so I don't think it really takes a genius to figure out that people want to converse <laughs> for requests mm -hmm. rather than looking in knowledge repositories. So Slack was an interesting one um, where I was very fortuitously kind of a, a fairly early shareholder. We had a, a company that we'd sold to them. And Slack... Um, Actually, do you know the full name, the the acronym? or Take us through it. Yeah. I know we, um, we talked about it at lunch. We but. talked about it at lunch, <laughs> but I thought just for the viewers. Um, but Slack is the um, searchable log of all conversations and knowledge. Um, so Slack's entire premise was that it was going to be some sort of central database or brain, and they've done basically all the things that you would call, you know, that now if you look at the assistance API and you look at, tokenization and pine cone and sure. vectorization and vector databases and vector search. Slack was doing that stuff in a more plot along sort of way, <laughs> which was, okay, let's take all of the stuff that's in this word document and let's make that queryable as well as metadata. So if you're looking for like employee leave policy, if Slack can find that that's mentioned or stuff similar to that is mentioned into any document using direct keyword lookup plus fuzzy lookup, fuzzy logic, et cetera, et cetera, that's why people use Slack, yeah. right? Um, because people found that people wanted to chat back and forth and share info. And the, you know, if I WhatsApp you and I, you know, I can, you know, work with some of my teams on WhatsApp and I WhatsApp you a file, um, the rest of the company can't see it, right? Correct. Um, if they come in and, and want to sort of use it. Um, so Slack always had a vision and, and actually a roadmap that in the S1 was pretty like heavily communicated um, where they really wanted to become... Um, kind of an AI assistant. Like that was really the intent of Slackbot, which sits in here, which gives you all the alerts um, for like approvals and this and that. And workflow automation was basically to become a knowledge repository that searched for that stuff automatically being like, oh, it looks like you've just joined just so you know, this is our medical policy or whatever it is. Yeah, it's interesting because you may, you know, a company may have things in their in their documents. If we're talking AI, maybe things that they're putting into retrieval mm -hmm. uh, libraries. And to that point, those are things that have been documented, and the large language models have documented things as well. 
but there's this invisible stuff that happens in private meetings and conversations. And, and it's really interesting. You mentioned, um, you know, the WhatsApp message, like the rest of the company can't see it because it's invisible sure. to one to one, one to one. Right. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's opportunities, I think, in business that are invisible to leaders. Yeah. You see the invisible. Yeah. Is that, take me through, how do you, how do you spot these things? Um, seeing the invisible. Well, yeah, because think about it. Um, in multifamily, it's the development process. We're very patient, understanding, like, we have to plan ahead. We have to think, we're really good at integrations. Mm -hmm. We have multiple disciplines from plumbing to architects. We have plans. <laughs> we follow those plans. We have regulate, you know, and we're patient with that capital. We have to think about the customer who we're building for all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to technology, we rush in some decisions. And that's why we're talking about what, you know, uh, when to not use AI, Yeah, you know, because, um, you know, you have to unwind things and, and, and stuff like that as business rolls out. But I'm I'm curious to you to to talk to you about like how when you see a multifamily portfolio, you're seeing what others don't see in many cases. Yeah. Um, and and what is that that? Yeah. Knowing first principles, knowing what's yeah, possible. I, I think so. I I think that there's a, I think the the multifamily industry is um is interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, it's the it's Residential real estate is the biggest industry on earth. Um, and I think it's enormously capital intensive. So when it's an when an industry is that enormously capital intensive and has that many stakeholders, um, there gets to be a lot of um, a lot of competitiveness, a lot of loss aversion, a lot of like focus on um, uh, visibility throughout the value chain. And I think that rigidity and visibility and sort of almost territorial habits that's begin to sort of come into play um, can be a disservice to our industry um, at various points in time. I mean, this is another thing we were talking about in lunch, you know, when you're talking about like the PMS landscape and building a potentially truly open source sort of PMS, you know, you know, the, the advent of Yardi, you know, to, to my knowledge, um, in terms of how it got to be so pervasive in the industry was it started as an accounting shop, mm. right? So it was, um, Anant Nyardi, from what I understood, used to be a, a chart, you know, a CPA who was working in the U.S. and worked sure. pre predominantly with multifamily owners and was doing well, uh, then built software around, you know, automating some of those processes. And the big institutional funds got used to sort of the reporting frameworks that he was doing, and there you've got this sort of, there go, you've got this sort of like, inter, you know, this accounting software that people are really relying on, which then snowballs into, it turns out, a, you know, ERP and a CRM and yada, 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 um, even if it's not, you know, perhaps the absolute best solution for each one of those things. And it's chosen to be very, very sort of closed off. Um, and I think that closeness and rigidity, which is a function of sort of the capital stack and the capital intensity um, of the industry, uh, you know, sometimes hurts hurts uh, a pragmatic person who, who might walk into the industry who is sort of newer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, newer entrants and more generally more pragmatic people would see things very differently from a, tech, from a technological lens because they're not sort of caught into the monolith. Yeah, you know, the more and more time I spend in the AI community talking to some really bright people, um, I notice the collaborative approach mm -hmm. where, I mean, developers understand that they build on top of sometimes other developers' work, and that makes for a greater marketplace, network effect, product. And you mentioned that sometimes as leaders, we end up staying with what's familiar, what's yeah. safe. And there, that makes sense. I mean, you know, you're fighting fires, you know, you're dealing with what's urgent mm -hmm. and important. Um, and, you know, back way back in the days of where the internet came along and it was print, it was like, you know, your phone number was an asset, mm -hmm. right? And so you had printed it on certain things. And so like changing a phone number would be problematic because you'd have to then do all this other stuff that can feel like a distraction, to the business, right? So you're, you're kind of stuck or you're, you feel sticky 
in some way. And, and yeah. to, the, to those providers that have built those businesses, I mean, good for them for creating a... Absolutely. I mean, I've, you know, yeah. what a wonderful founder story to be able to build Absolutely. demand and retention and, yeah. and all that stuff. But I think where we go next is really interesting because, um, you know, for an executive to truly unlock value within the organization, um, they need to see data. You can't do AI without data. Correct. Right? And so... Um, you know, that's, that's a conversation that's not solved in one meeting, but it's, it's where. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, and it's interesting because it isn't, you know, so when, when we were at Groupon back in the day, um, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I heard it said colloquially, so don't quote me on it as, as for sure true. But my understanding was we were at one point Salesforce.com's largest global customer mm. uh, by number of records because we had. Um, in Chicago, 600 West Chicago, we had 3,000 sales reps who were cold calling every yeah. spa and restaurant and whatever. And we spun up a, a ton of data and a ton of ton of records. And we did a, I remember us doing a, a migration, taking from like leads to accounts and like changing the disposition of how it was. Working. And we took down Salesforce, like global, uh, took down their servers. Like it was cat- catastrophe, <laughs> not just for us, but for Salesforce globally. But interestingly, you know, it isn't unusual for CRM providers in all industries. And Salesforce used to be like this. Um, to once they've got your data, um, say this is ours. Um, so Salesforce at the time had like very limited ability to export. They had very limited ability to do APIs, to sure. all this sort of stuff. They had rate limits that were super heavy. They'd cite, you know, vagaries like, oh, compute is expensive, blah, 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 blah. But really it was like, we want to lock you in. Right? Yeah. We want to lock you in. And I think that's like very much, um, if for better or for worse, like, I, mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt anyone else's businesses, but, um, seems to be the case with, with sort of the large PMS providers here. Yeah. And it really has been quite, um, cost prohibitive. And, you know, I know that Entrada recently introduced a fee as well. Um, yeah. but it's sometimes it's 20 to $50,000 a year to be integrated with the RD or sure. Entrada or like one of these groups. And it's not even about the cost, uh, you know, the, the API, the process of being approved for the API firstly requires you to have a customer, a joint customer, right, who is aggressively advocating for you. Yeah. Um, also, could be a competitive environment too, because well, some of the that's the other thing they they ask for your use case, they ask for your financial, they ask for like a lot of stuff that's pretty right. invasive, to be blunt. Um, and that stuff is is reviewed by the corp dev teams. Sure. Um, and that's known to be the case because, and then they then they say, okay, well we'd like to let you on the platform, but like that may be influencing their own sort of product roadmap. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, as we talk through those things, what it really comes down to is when you pull the lens back, you know, you're trying to create value for the end customer, the resident, right? And so if we want to unlock innovation, I believe in the industry, then, you know, we can get more efficient with many things in the business that allows these real estate operators to not only depend on one source of income. Right. Because with limited units, you just can't, I mean, you you could build more if you found land and all that stuff, but like on your site, you have 300 units. Yeah. You have <laughs> 300 rental checks that you could p- potentially get. Yeah. And uh, that's where I think where you're finding alpha yeah. in, in other ways that gives relief to be able to, you know, fulfill obligations that these real estate companies have made to investors mm-hmm. in ways that could be significant, yeah. I think, uh, material. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's get into it. You know, so with, with, with Blue Lake, what we're doing is we really were a alternative income partner for um, multifamily operators. Um, we're, we're saying to them, you know, at a 10,000 foot level, basically people, uh, multifamily investors are asset driven, hard asset driven people. And they have their assets, which are their land and their brick and their mortar and their elevators and you know whatever whatever's in there. Right. Um, but they have another asset that they um, tend not to value, um, uh, which is c- data, uh, customer data and you know insights and the contact information of people who are interacting with their with their properties. Um, fortunately, you know, and though real estate operators themselves don't value this data, 
Um, it's very clear that the financial markets do. You need only look at the valuations of Facebook and Google who own no real estate, right? <laughs> but own customer data. Sure. Right. So should you have the ability to sort of like monetize customer data? That's obviously something that puts an enormous sort of multiple in your business. Now, most real estate operators obviously uh, don't come from that background. You know, it's a totally different way of operating. It's totally different technological stack and skill set required. So we've been um, partnering with real estate, with multifamily operators in the most um, non-invasive ways possible sure. um, to help them to generate income streams from uh, from customer data that they're housing at no cost to them. Uh, they're actually more like vendors to us and we, we revenue share with them. Yeah. And in your network, you have access to some of the brightest minds in AI and intelligence around this stuff. So it's like, you know, if you have... 2,500 units, you know, ideally that data scientist and, or, you know, the engineer is likely not going to want to come into that organization and re reshape it and reimagine it because they're going to be working for teams like yours and, sure. and doing big reshaping industries and, yeah. and seeing greater upsides. And that's why I think it's interesting what you're doing to provide a lot of value to sort of be this outside arm that comes in and, value engineers financial opportunities that otherwise people don't even know is possible. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is anybody who's going through a moving event um, is going through a major, major life transition. You know, if mm -hmm. you're, if you're moving, you're moving because you're some planned, some unplanned, <laughs> Yeah, some planned, some unplanned, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and hopefully positive, but some also not so positive, but yeah. you know, let's, let's start with the positive ones. You know, you're getting married or you're having a child sure. or you're, you know, you're starting a new exciting job and, in Chicago from New York city where rent is one third. Um, and, uh, and you know, you're, you're keen to getting moving forward with life, but like, you know, when somebody is going through a moving event, um, people know that this is when all new purchasing behavior is born. Right. So I'm moving to downtown Chicago from Manhattan. I need to get an apartment, but not only do I need to get an apartment, I need to find a gym. I need to find a supermarket. Mm. I need to, you know, I might get a new credit card. I might do, you know, like Quite a lot of things. I, I might sure. find a romantic partner. I might want to be mm -hmm. on Tinder. I might, girls those things. Once I've lived in that unit for long enough, maybe I meet someone there. Maybe now I need a bigger place. Maybe I need to purchase a place. Maybe, you know, maybe I need a mortgage. There's all, there's all these sorts of intents, um, customer, potential customer purchasing intents that exist sure. um, in and around a moving event. Um, but the difficulty is how do you become that trusted guide or that trusted person that takes them through? So, um, Blue Lake's use of conversational AI is basically by being um, a conversational front end, um, which is a concierge, um, the core concept of which is empathy, like an extremely empathetic concierge connected to um, what I'd call SKUs or SKU databases, okay. which have various different types of products for different things that people could need based on uh, what they're doing. We roll up that income stream and we do it at very good margins, and we give a chunk to our operators. Yeah. Um, I know you're about to ask how much. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, the thing is, this is happening already anyway, right? So it's just a matter of, you mentioned the the enterprise value of, like, the bigger companies, like Google, companies that do get the data right. Yep. Uh, there, There's, and we're talking about AI, too, and when not to use it in some cases. Um, not having the data makes it very hard to, to you know, not use AI or leverage it in the in the right places, and so I, I start to think about um, you know as you as you move through these opportunities for companies, you know what what how how should they think through them because they they're not coming with this knowledge to the table right they're 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 looking at their cap rate they're looking at their budget they're looking at their day to day operations. Um, what are some of the questions that they should be asking when when going through some? Yeah, so I, I think there's what we do, which is Blue Lake, which is mm -hmm. taking these lost cause um, renter and queries or move-ins that we're not monetizing anyway right. and attempting to monetize it. I think that's a great use case for AI. The reason I think that's a great use case for AI is it's very, very high scale. It's very repetitive. Responsiveness is extremely important. And the stakes are pretty low, meaning if I get it right, it's worth something. But if I get it wrong... I mean, the thing was already worth zero. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like something has catastrophically gone wrong. 
What concerns me the most is when we see multifamily operators talking to us about using AI in their core operations. And they're either picking something that is not repeatable enough <laughs> to warrant it. Sure. Is not scalable enough to warrant it. Or, and here's the scariest one, if they put in AI and it hallucinates, something could go catastrophically wrong. Yeah. Um, I had a developer um, approach me recently um, who is who uh, had a team that did you know rehab sort of stuff, taking B minus and turning him to B plus or anything. And what he was concerned about was um, codes, building codes and building mm -hmm. code uh, stuff. So sort of trying to build a conversational agent that um, uh, you vectorize or put in pine cone or something. You know, sure. All the codes and the rules and documents, and then said, "Hey, like, can we build?" this x and like get a yes or no or get a you know get feedback on it and get citations um and i almost had a meltdown I was, mm -hmm. like, I was like yes um but like how are they doing this so far he's like well they would you know it's a lot of documents but they know the similar terms and like you know i have a team that does this and they do keyword look they basically do control f and do keyword lookups sure i was like please still do the keyword look <laughs> right because um LLMs are not, they're not meant to return correct answers. Mm -hmm. They're meant to, given an input of tokens, given yeah. an output of tokens that look similar. Sure. It's so, generative. So if you literally <laughs> said, said, asked it, you know, am I allowed to, you know, do I need to have any low income housing here? Um, it could say, it would say, no, you're not allowed to have any low income housing. And then if you write to it back and say, Actually, I am. It'll say, oh, yeah, you're correct. It's actually yes. <laughs> right? Because right. it's not trying to factually answer the question. Right. It's trying to give you a token of text that looks, that is logical. Sure. You know, given the, the preceding token of text. Yes. And the preceding token of text is a yes or no question. It's going to give either yes or no, mm -hmm. depending on like what it thinks you want to say. You know, it's kind of, right. kind of like, um, I'm sorry for, for married people out there. Like, I, I sometimes do this. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk about, she's like, can we go to dinner? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you gonna go? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. right. You know what I'm saying? So, Short answer. So it's sort of like you're not listening, but you're trying to you're not really listening to it or giving yeah. an actual answer, but you're trying to give uh agreeable sounding response. Sure. Uh so that's kind of what like large language models are doing. And yes, with vectorization um of documents and knowledge repositories, certainly like the risks have um like it it's become more accurate. I would say it's definitely moving in the direction of more accurate. But you know, when when we are in a enterprise multifamily context, and you're talking about a hundred million dollar physical asset, and you know somebody wants to save, you know, ten, you know five hours a week of time for mm -hmm. like a well trained staff member who knows sure. how to do this stuff and has a lot of reasoning and says, I don't know, this doesn't feel right. Like I feel like yeah, we did sure. talk about low income in, in that meet in that meeting six months ago when we were looking at the plans. Yeah, the AI is not going to have that knowledge and. Right. I think my my major use cases are like when people are trying to replace AI, use AI to replace basically a search function, uh, a control F or a keyword lookup. I'd say vector databases are not great for that. Mm -hmm. um, and God forbid it's not even relying on a vector database and it's just doing like some sort of Google search or Bing or something like that on the back end. Yeah. Um, then you really can be in trouble. So. Um, I think AI is effective if you can constrain it to to the, really mimicking the human, right? If you can say, hey, like, I don't want to run a vector search. Like, you can actually, if you were using Langchain or Langsmith appropriately, instead of saying, hey, here's this 300-page document, uh, answer this question, you could say, um, come up with the 10 words that I need to use to answer this question around tender that I could use a potential lookup low income or section eight mm -hmm. and then run a control F function for each of it and then re respond to me the chunks of text. That's really what your admin person is doing, right? Sure. That's the safer way to go. Um, and I think people get, they think these are sort of God models and they, they get you know, right. a little bit overzealous. Yeah. You need to start with your process, right? How yeah. how do how is work getting done? I always say that there's a difference between automated and autonomous. Yes, and I think it's a little uh, ambitious to to be autonomous in some of these 
situations that you're talking about because then you're, you know, you know, people begin and end the process. There's some level of review. Mm-hmm. Then you can automate the stuff in the middle. Yeah. But it's still the the leader is still making a decision from you know it's it's more assistant than artificial at that point. Right. But um, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and there are there are human in the loop frameworks, right? So where you can do that, and then it has to go to someone for approval, and then that person sort of says yes. But um, I I just get really I get really worried with this stuff because so many people think this is how they're going to operate their business, and it like there's a reason that you have that person who's been reviewing building codes with you for twenty years and costs a mm-hmm. hundred thousand dollars. It's because they've been with you for twenty years and they've seen all these things and there's all of this stuff that they're intuiting around. Mm-hmm. Um and offloading this stuff when it's super high stakes if something goes wrong. Yeah. Is a horrendous idea. <laughs> right. And let's talk about frameworks, yeah. shall we? Sure. I mean, um wh- how how what are the frameworks we should be thinking through? So I yeah, I, I think it's uh, how to say it? it's just the the use case has to be Correct. So I I think that first things first, don't try and skip what the labor is, what the person who's doing it today is doing. Mm -hmm. Don't try and leapfrog them. Try and mimic them, right? So if the person is doing a control F search, program it to do a control F search. I I will tell you what's interesting is just this is where I think AI can be a benefit Mm -hmm. without even using AI. The idea of Using AI is you first you need to look at your current process, who's doing it, where's the data, what tools they use, you know, all that stuff, right? And we we did this. We have we have this framework we take people through. It's like a sort of like a time assessment thing, mm-hmm. right? And you you can't do that until you understand like, okay, well, who's doing the work? How's it done? What steps are they taking? And then there's the actions that you'd want to have happen. And it was interesting that just by getting the just journaling what was done for the week on these things and what tools were used allowed us to realize like, wow, we've got four people we're paying high dollar amounts sitting in a 60 minute meeting mm-hmm. every week. And so originally we just said, well, let's just stop doing that meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so without even using AI to the fact of getting ready to use AI, we le- we found money. Yeah. We didn't even use AI yet. Right. Yeah. And so when you talk about mimicking the work, that, like there's value because sometimes these things creep into the organization. People love to surround themselves with work and busy work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 the CEOs don't always know that Sarah, three departments down, what when they say do the thing that they've got to go into four different systems and pull out and download and upload and do the thing, they don't have visibility over the work. That's what I love about this is that. Because we, we went from a, a leadership responsibility where you could see work, like you had an office and you knew when they were there and you saw them working and they were in the boardroom with you and you saw them on calls. We visually see the work. But now with even remote work and people in different areas, we don't often see where work gets done. But when you get these things into tables and into databases, into systems, we have a whole nother visibility of how work gets done. And I think if executives knew, they could be trained to find value within the organization. Completely, yeah. I mean, if if your need to use AI forces you to first do this pre-work, that's a win enough. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, you know, this sort of like what you're describing is, you know, to what extent, some extent, recently, recently it's called first principles thinking, um, just data driven operating operating in general um i think um it's probably more valuable and then ai is sort of like a tool set right like kind of at, sure. kind of at the end of it that like may or may not be relevant but probably 98% of the win is just adopting a culture that's yeah. looking for efficiency um and that's really breaking things away from roles and into sort of accountabilities mm-hmm. right and yeah. sort of saying like we do we need a head of marketing or do we need leads to apartment buildings? Right. Because a head of marketing may result in leads to marketing building, apartment buildings. They also may not. It might be, you know, a performance marketing person who's yeah. not a head of marketing. It might not even be a performance marketing person. It might be an agency. Yeah. It, it and we be. have our biases coming into these conversations because we grew up. And, and this is the other problem that you may be bumping into more than, than I is as 
people are considering these things, they're quite successful. Yeah. And they've been cashing million dollar checks for a long, long time. Yeah. And they, they did that in a, in a world that um, AI didn't exist in some case. I mean, obviously in later years here, but, um, and so there's, it's tough to make change when you have so much certainty around how the wealth was already created. Like what's the incentive Right. Yeah, the incentive is if Jerome Powell just continues to raise rates, you know, then we're yeah. all going to get pretty creative. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> right? out of necessity, right? Out of necessity. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Like, I think, you know, I, I've been a fixed income investor as well, and my family used to fix income invest, and it's pretty easy to do well uh, when rates, you know, over a 10, 15 years horizon go towards zero, and you're in an asset class that yeah. linearly benefits from that while giving you cash flow while being very liquid. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So like the second you, um, things get tough, you, you got to go to the mat and you got to find a way. Yeah. Um, I, I love the, the conversation around, uh, well, self-driving autonomous vehicles, uh, obviously very data driven. I recently, uh, went and toured one or actually went on a ride down here in, uh, Phoenix, uh, it's a, sort of a, Waymo yeah, the Waymo. Okay. Have you been in one? No, not yet. Actually, okay. I'm going to do that later. <laughs> yeah, you will. You will. It's it's pretty interesting. And and so here's the deal. At first, I'll tell you a quick story. We were in a sort of, we upgraded to uh, in a rideshare, uh, current rideshare uh, vendor or product. <laughs> we summoned our ride. And halfway through the ride, um, we realized uh, it got scary. Like literally, like, you know, aggressive driving. Okay. And this was a like a five star driver, and I was like, I wasn't expecting that. Oh, and this was with a human. This was me in the ride. Yeah. Okay. So with the, exactly, and what happened was, um, that driver got a new ride and wanted to finish my ride oh, to see. be able to time and accept the other one. Sure. So the interests weren't aligned yeah. <laughs> to our safety. Yeah. And so it's funny because we were, we were having brunch and then we're like, oh, let's try the Waymo, right? So we, we, we got the, I'm like, well, we'll fix that problem. First principles thinking, right? Okay. Uh, Elon says, you know, engineers often optimize something that shouldn't exist. Well, in this case, it was the driver, right? Like, so I'm like, we can do this. We'll, we, got the, we got the app, uh, summoned a, a Waymo, came. And immediately when I hit the app, it said, and this was brilliant marketing, it said the most experienced driver is on the way. Mm. And I thought, you know what? This this thing is probably driven more than I have. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because probably millions. <laughs> millions of <laughs> yeah. miles or something, right? Because yeah. it's just always driving and it's probably yeah. paying attention more than me and stuff like that. And I know that there's a lot in, involved in that. But I start to think about when you look at what feels what we're, what feels safe because we're familiar, like, you know, there's a steering wheel. I would say the Waymo next would not even have the steering wheel. Right. Yeah. Because what, why would you need that if, right. So, but right now it's there. Yeah. And I always tell uh, our teams and people I'm sharing time with, like in the state of transformation, we talk about things as they used to be for us to even have context for what they are. So cordless phone, you know, right now, self-driving car, it was horseless carriage. I mean, everything, motion pictures for uh, cinema and all that. And so uh, at first it was a picture, then it moved, and now, well, what is, wait, it's a video. No, we don't know. We're not even to video. It's like, it's a motion picture. Yeah. And in the states that you're moving people through, I got to imagine that there's a level of um, uh, context to what it was and what it what it can be. Yeah. Um, do you feel like transformation is as important as AI? More. Yeah. Important. Yeah. I mean, it, like it's look, it's always crawl, it's crawl, walk, run, right? Like you have to you have to start small. You have to get it right. You have to build the trust. You got to get the steering wheel there for some period of time. Mm -hmm. When you start seeing that the thing's not going to run into the road, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's when you start doing it. So I I think it's. I think the sh the sh it's great that it's exciting and everyone's like AI this AI that whatever but it it really is I think a, a mentality and you know the Mark Zuckerberg's been saying it and all these people saying like look Facebook cut 10 20,000 employees what happened to revenue nothing earnings exploded right mm -hmm. like the the 
you know, in, in Elon's words, like removing things that, um, most people are optimizing things that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, probably many of the roles don't need to exist, but that's not an AI statement. That's a cultural statement. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact of the matter is that the majority of the world is doing something that I would state, um, whether that's a head of leasing, whether that's a leasing agent, whether that's a even asset manager to some extent, are doing something that can be summarized as a conversational agent who looks at a database, right? So if I'm head of leasing, I see a thousand leads coming in. I was trying to see how many went to tour, yeah. I'm trying to see how many applied. And I call the agent who has a low tour to close rate and say, what are you doing? You know, or how, why didn't you get this many people to tour? And I talk to him, right? Mm -hmm. That's a conversational agent with a database. Head of asset management, I say, and rent rolls good, rent rolls not good, renewals are good, renewals are not good when compared to the 10 other properties because I'm running a spreadsheet, you know. Um, here's 50 of my assets and this one's got extremely high NOI and this one has lower NOI and this one, the least velocity is this and that one's the least velocity that and this one's doing comparably worse. And then I reach out to the person and I say, hey, you know, Green Gables Apartments, you know, you guys aren't doing so great. Look at these guys, you know, in another state, but um, they're outperforming in lease velocity, they're outperforming in occupancy, they're outperforming in NOI. What's going on? And I try and have a conversation about that. I think most of those things are, are ripe for at least first step automation, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like... We it, don't get the defensive behavior. Sorry? You don't get the defensive answer. You get the Correct. right answer. You get the right answer. So I think they're they're ripe for at least first stage automation where there's no reason every dashboard, every spreadsheet that everyone's looking at shouldn't be, instead of them having to log in to look at it, on the flip side, an alert-based system that says, you know, anytime one of my properties is doing super well, shoot me a note, <laughs> right? And it just sort of, and you know, the LLM can shoot you a note. Like, sure. This, this one's good. We recommend you reach out to Catherine, who's over there, and, and give her whatever... You know, would you like me to do it? Yes or no? Yeah, here are some good questions. Even here are some good questions, and and as long as you're doing this stuff with like human in the loop, um, and making sure that somebody's there, and you're not taking any majorly consequential decision, like that, you know, we're we're talking about a positive scenario. Let's talk about a negative scenario, where Catherine's actually an underperformer, and the algorithm says, oh, "Let her go." <laughs> And reaches out and terminates her. That's a catastrophe. Right. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, because maybe there's a bunch of extenuating circumstances. Or forget that. Maybe you don't want the algorithm, you know, involved in it to like mm -hmm. that extent. Let's lean into the human in the loop uh, framework. Mm -hmm. What? How do you? How would you share? Um, reflect on we, that. We can show you. We can show you in our systems. But I mean, you're familiar with um, Langchain mm -hmm. and Langsmith, right? So Langchain, Langsmith, a lot of these things have. Um, what we're talking about, are you familiar with agentic frameworks? I'm not, no. Okay. Are we talking about embeddings of... No. Um, agentic frameworks are born out of process revision. Are you familiar with process revision? No. Okay. So the, the reason that large language models um, are so exciting isn't because it's a chatbot that you can shoot the shit with, which, I mean, of course, it's cute and whatever. You know, you can make jokes to it and say, hey give me this song and the style of Jay-Z and whatever. And like all that stuff is great, but it's that you can use it to become a decision engine. And the reason that you can use it to like an actual end to end close to autonomous agent. And the, the core reason for that is because of sort of chain of thought prompting. You feel the chain of thought. Mm -hmm. So basically the way you just like a thread for yeah, where, so uh, how it came to system. A so, like, you and I remember what we said to each other yes. in the previous we, context. And we coax each other. So, right. so for example, let me give you an example um, where it says, you know, what is the, um, uh, what's uh, two times ten, mm -hmm. right? So, there's two ways of making the model work. When it says, you can say, what's two times ten? And it'll say twenty. So, if it says two times ten is twenty, what that's doing is that's just doing token extension, thing two times 10 20 looks like plausible it might give you might just as well give you 30 or 40 or 50 but if it says i would like to calculate two times 10 um 
please give me the steps to get there. Then I'll say, 2 plus 2 is 2 times 2 is 4, and 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, and 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 8, and da, 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 10. So this is what we call sort of chain of thought, um, which is like getting it to explain how it is deriving and it's change. It's getting to what it's what it's saying is ultimately the answer. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, all, um, you know, this is some of the stuff that, well, now is exposed in the media, but like wasn't openly talked about before. You know, people look at OpenAI as sort of a tech company, uh, and it is very much a tech company, but like that tech was trained by tens of thousands of humans, um, principally in Kenya, actually, in Nigeria, Ooh. some markets where I actually have some offshore staff as well, um, who are paid like two bucks an hour to like rate the appropriateness of answer. So it was sort of like two times two, two, you know, two times 10 is 20. Correct. Yes or no. Now what they've done is now we've started moving from two times 10 is 20 to two times 10 is 20. Explain your thoughts. And says, well, two plus two is four, two plus two plus two is six, blah, 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 and like kind of do the breakdown. And it says, yes, I agree with the reasoning process you took to come to this. Mm. So that second type of thing where we've gone from um, like input output to showing showing the process of reasoning and then and then supervising that process is called process supervision. Mm -hmm. So process supervision is about changing reward models from from um, from being token input to token output to being like what is the process through which you took this token input and ultimately came to that token output mm. and many times that reasoning is taking place in the background and you're not seeing the, you're not and OpenAI is not showing you those steps sure right like you can coax it to show you the steps as well as a user if you want but like in actuality it's doing it without using those steps so mm -hmm. um we're seeing sort of like tool selection like this sort of stuff happening as well so where it's like hey like what's the uh when was nelson mandela born you know was Nelson Mandela a good guy? How old is he? Mm -hmm. So like, you'll realize Nelson Mandela is a good guy, sort of a subjective thing. If LLM tokenization, okay, yeah, and generally people speak about him positively. He's a good guy, great. And it says, and how old is he? He's no longer around, obviously, but you know, it'll go like, okay, well, now that is a factual answer. For that, I have to go through tool selection. Do I? And then I have an API for Bing. Because Bing is the the integrated yeah. API at the moment, search API, go through. This was the age, and then, okay, now that I have that, now I'm gonna take you know, take the birth date and derive it by today's date, and say, you know, he would have been this many years old, but unfortunately he deceased in the case of Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela. Um, so it's about um, cultivating rules engines over periods of time. So like, um, if I take that and I take a step back from that, and let's come back to the person who's sort of doing the multifamily, um zoning stuff right like the developer is looking doing zoning so it's sort of like okay it's coming out that this one says no low-income housing allowed but is that consistent with what we've seen let me second guess myself Ooh. all right so it's like okay yeah that's the answer but let's like triple check that answer okay well let's look at all comparable projects we have do we have many where no low-income housing is allowed do we have other buildings in the areas, low-income housing allowed there or not? And that sort of like second, third layer, like the model questioning itself, inference, is really where things are going to go. But if you talk about that, and, you know, there's a there's like somebody that I know, somebody who's come to my talks, much more successful founder than me, guy named uh, Mike Merchinson, who's in Canada, his company called Ada, it's now valued at $2 billion. Um, he talks a lot about how to, he's been doing similar to us, conversational AI, in his case, in customer service for, they handle like all of AirAsia, for example. But he was saying that one of the things that Mike says, which I think is great, is that you really have to treat your AI as an employee. Hmm. So, you know, when we get back to the person who's looking at, you know, those things for code, you know, building codes, you know, you trust her blindly because she'd been working for you for 15 years. Yeah. You didn't trust her blindly 15 years ago. Right, because <laughs> you've had many corrections, adjustments. Corrections, adjustments, <laughs> you know, knowledge repository that's been... Good things, but... Yeah. Pro she's had process supervision. Yeah. She's had, like, you are doing a good right. job of this. This is how you reason through this. If something looks a little unusual, you should double check, triple mm -hmm. check. 
Um, you should check this knowledge process. You should look at four other comparables. You should use your sort of judgment. And sure. the question becomes like, how do we inculcate judgment into AI agents if an AI agent is ultimately going to become basically your employee or is sort of like, you know, mm-hmm. offsetting the work of what was historically done by an employee. And that is going to be an arduous and continuous investment. And the precursor to all of that, as you rightly stated, is cultural change. Mm. So if you take that cultural view that you're looking for efficiency in your business, you know, that's a precursor to any of this, <laughs> right? When that starts happening, uh, you may find that you never even get to the AI part <laughs> because if you found a way to, to, you, yeah, you, to, to train people to do it and you find the AI is unnecessary. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really a function of like, do we want to find efficiencies? Do we want to break things down into first principles and think, does this role need to exist in this way, right? Um, do I really need a head of like zoning, you know, uh, zoning checks? Is that like a, a role on an org chart that needs to exist? Or do I just need the zones checked, right? Same thing. Do I really need a head of marketing or do I need leads to my properties? Because leads to my properties may come from a head of marketing. They may not. They may come from, you know, a variety of different ways. Or maybe I don't even need leads to my properties. Who knows, Right. Yeah, no, no, those are uh, really great points. Um, so when I th- pull back, to, as you reflect on this uh, transformation, I think about like, well, what is a company? A company, if you think about it, um, going back historically, um, you know, had uh, physical resources, uh, buildings, things of that nature. And, you know, those that grew in scale had the ability to bring together capital resources, financial resources, you know, loans, debt, all, all that to to really grow and scale. And then as the physical resources, leveraging financial resources uh, grew, you'd end up, I mean, we'll take a very easy example, Blockbuster, right? More stores in more cities, more revenue, right? So now you, you now have more what? Employees, mm-hmm. which brought the third piece, which was the human resources. So you had physical resources, financial resources, and now human resources. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty much every company that existed. And now, as I speak to real estate owners and operators, they're looking at, they're good at the financial resources. Mm-hmm. They can bring JV deals together like better than anybody in the world, right? Uh, they can see value. They can see a piece of dirt, have a vision for the future, make it happen, take the risks. Uh, great at people, like building teams, leading people, all that stuff, right? Great at, great at that piece of, of, of things. So they've got the physical resources, they've got the financial resources, and they've got the human resources. And then this fourth part is this technology as leverage. What I hope to do is inspire people to realize as good as a CEO knows how to do debt deals, uh, cap, all, all the things that pull leverage on a real estate deal that they need to speak to someone like you, right? Or, or uh, anybody that's really joining forces with bringing technology into a company, not even AI, just tech. Sure. And look at it like it's not something you give to IT. Like this is part of building a healthy company that oh, yeah. most companies are technology companies that just don't know. And that's what goes back to my point, seeing the invisible. You see that fourth piece. You know, we were talking about oil and refining and and if you could just imagine all this value that's unlocked in your business as a CEO um, where do you point people other than you know calling you up and working with you on these types of things but like where do you point people to accelerate the learning to understand it's as important as understanding debt equity financial resources and these types of things that make up a company the number one thing is I think most people who are at senior levels, like CXO levels in multifamily operators, specifically institutional ones, come from finance backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And how I learned to this stuff, and I you know, don't have a formally coding background, I have an econometrics background, um, is from building financial models. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I worked at Citigroup and I worked in investment banks, we'd have to build large financial models where we would do things like, say we were modeling multifamily, you know, here's this asset and our rent assumption is three bucks a square foot. But my MD is going to come in and ask me, well, what if it's only two? And I need to be able to change one cell and it needs to flow through. And I need to be able to test sensitivities. 
So most people who are who can build a financial model that's basic in Excel are coding. Mm-hmm. They don't realize they're coding, but they're right. coding. <laughs> it's right? a different interface. It's a different interface, and it's a simpler interface, and it's algebra and whatever. If you can build a discounted cash flow model, you can use Zapier. Are you familiar with Zapier? Oh, yeah. 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 So Zapier is like one of those most simple, like, if this, then that. Right. Conditional automation software is on earth. And there are so many low code solutions out there to, you know, do things. But I think, you know, and we were talking about this earlier in you know, at lunch, once again, you know, in, in my business, I do one repetitive thing at extremely high scale, right? Ooh. 30,000 renter inquiries a day coming through my, you know, my drive through and I'm trying to service them and find them apartments and do things like this. Um, so I'm the equivalent of sort of like McDonald's, right? So, you know, McDonald's is 100% a management science play. How the heck are they making money selling $1 McChicken? Sure. Well, they're doing it because they built such scale and such efficiency because they built a supply chain and a machine that was purpose-built for one repetitive action taking place again and again and again and again. And they put thought into every inch of that place, like the burger buns, should, you know, should they be sure. pieced together? or should, Where, Do they reach to the left or right? Reach I mean, to the left the right? You know, should there be sesame seeds? Should there not be sesame seeds? If there's sesame seeds or not sesame seeds, what are the consequences, right? If it's sesame seeds, you know, should the bun be this way? Should it be this way? Should they be put together or should they be on the separate sure. sides of it? You know? We've got, we got to get the perfect French fry. How do we get the perfect French fry? You know, this is a labor of love, you know, what they've done, sure. right? They're like, they're like, okay, we got to make this simple enough that like we can put in those fries and they're, you know, they must've had inconsistencies in the French fries back in the day because there was, you know, coming in and people would cut the potatoes different sizes. Now they're cut the perfect size. Now they put them in the thing. I'm sure at one point somebody was putting up and down the, you know, the fryer. Yeah. Uh, that no longer happens. It's completely One third of a second. Yeah. <laughs> it's completely automated because it needs to be exactly precise. It needs to be consistently done. And they've still got humans and they're doing it. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a sort of symphony, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, in terms of that. So I think the, the, it makes sense to automate you know, burger production, if you're McDonald's and you sell 30,000 you know, sure. burgers a day or whatever you're selling, I know, millions probably globally a day. But if you're, you know, uh, you know, there's a burger joint that's up in Canada, I'm Canadian, called The Works, and The Works charges $27 per burger. <laughs> and they pride themselves on, you know, bison meat and you know, they'll put avocado and they'll put two fried eggs in there. Yeah. And they'll put, you yeah. know, you can... You can you can, you're supposed to wait. Like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can customize, you know, the kinds of like chili flakes you want and this yeah. and that and sauces and this and that. And the, you know, and if I start building that with an automated machine and I took away all the options, all the values eroded. Sure. So I think like a lot of the, um, a lot of the tasks that like a multifamily operator at an institutional level is dealing with, um, he very well could use Zapier and things like that to automate some of them. Yeah. But like, I'd say, you know, buying a hundred million dollar apartment building. Yeah. It's a lot closer to the you know the twenty seven dollar burger than the one dollar sure. <laughs> junior McChicken. Right, right. There's few that don't yeah. do it. So it's a, it's sort of like you got to find the junior McChickens. Sure. Right. What are the junior McChickens in your business? What is the like basic, repetitive, high volume, yeah. low margin? Uh, you know, I don't really care about it, but it like you know, they they probably don't make very much money on junior McChickens. Like it's fine. People come in and they get them, and that's volume. You're right. Right, and they're able to amortize the fixed cost of running that operation, and hopefully they'll buy some higher margin product while they're there. Yeah, right? that's um, interesting. So, I'd say find your junior McChickens, and like that's what you should be automating. But like, the the majority of the stuff in your business probably isn't a junior McChicken. Yeah. So don't go chasing the automation. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny you mentioned Zapier. I uh, we that's and, and I'm going to show you uh, while you're in town here. The we we kind of took that model. And made it for multifamily because there's no network effect in a marketplace like that because it's mostly for, you know, freelancers or people that are familiar with how to connect APIs and things like that. But if you take a, a marketplace like that where you can connect system A to system B and then, and then get everything and start with everything outside the PMS, right? You start to think about an email signature, 
Mm-hmm. And if your turnover is 40%, and you know that is the thing that occurs and on and on and on, and, and you know you're going to be candidate experience, resumes coming in at volume and things like that. And those are the types of things that are the low-hanging fruit or the, the crawl, walk, run stuff that you can build a workflow around. Yes. You know, and uh, th- so that's, it's interesting you say that because. Um, that's your junior chicken. Yeah. And, and like the magic. stakes, high volume thing. Right. And, and, and the re- what we've found is that people actually, when hired, don't want to do that type of work, right? Like, so now you're, you know, in a way improving the employee experience uh, and, and repurposing them into things that, that lead to either more revenue or yeah. other parts of the business. Higher value. <laughs> Higher value. Yeah, exactly. Higher value things that you need humans for. Exactly. Exactly. My, my mantra is aggressively automate, aggressively humanize. Mm-hmm. You have to be doing both. Right. Right. If we have people in the organization and we're automating away their work, it's not so that they don't do any work. Right. It's so that they apply the human layer, you know, to that work. So like it might be saying, hey, give this customer this apartment. But then we ultimately expect when that message is delivered for it to be delivered with great care mm-hmm. and empathy and attention, de- attention to detail and contextualization. Right. Um, we, we have some really great conversations in our Innovation Council. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those of you listening or watching, Multifamily Innovation Council, we talk to multifamily owners and operators on a weekly basis around the challenges they want to solve, the priorities from fraud, centralizing the business, property automation, business automation, all these types of things. And that's kind of how we end up in conversations like what we're having is like we first identify what is it going, what's going to make the business better that's the way we look at innovation, not the new tech. It's like, what's going to make the business better, either by driving more profitability, saving money, more revenue, whatever that is. And that's it. Right? Yeah. And so when when we have these conversations, we're like, well, okay, well, who's solving these things? That's kind of how we ended up you know, bringing you in to, to have these conversations. But I, we have some really good, healthy debates because everybody has this window by which they see the world because of, A, how they were influenced grow, you know, growing up and then also how they worked. You know, they, they get a good job, they do a good job, they get promoted, rewarded, they go to the next level, now they're in charge of others, they tell others how to do their job. And it sort of influences this, in some cases, it could be bureaucracy, it could be waste in the organization just from familiarity. And so that's why these first principles thinking is kind of unlocks some of those things. Well, what if... We could do that. What if we didn't, you know, what if we could lease without depending on a human? We don't, we're not making the debate you should have one or not, but if you didn't have to depend on it, yeah. what then? Yeah. And so these debates are, are fun, exciting, and I would love to have you come in and yeah, we could sure. facilitate some fun stuff there. But we have some that are completely nobody on site and some that are like, how do I get to a new model, centralized, specialize, whatever they want to call it, like testing assumptions about how work is done or, or, or can be done. Yeah. I was, um, you got me thinking and I, there's something I want to share. So obviously, as you know, I was an early shareholder in Slack, very, very fortuitous. Um, and that created some wealth. Eventually I was trying to uh, be a real adult. I just had a kid, as you know, we've got a, growing up still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I just had a kid and that, you know, having a kid and having to just sober up and look at the world and how real responsible adults, you know, make money. It's what led me towards multifamily. Um, but I've had the good fortune that I, I keep um, quite a bit of portfolio allocation. So I'm a partner at a venture fund in Canada um, and I keep portfolio allocation towards venture and tech. And one of the big reasons I get to learn stuff um, and I'm a good fortune being a J.P. Morgan private bank client. You normally have to have way more assets than I have to be there, but I don't know. They were nice to me. They they seem to be taking a bet on me. <laughs> a, a young guy who may get there in the future. Well, Jim, yeah. Like, so they're like, okay, this is a smaller portfolio, but we'll take it. Um, but through that, I got to meet Tiger Global. Have you heard of Tiger Global? No, tell me more. Um, so Tiger Global is a New York-based um, hedge fund uh, originally that became one, one of the most prolific late-stage um, – venture capital investors now in the world. So they go neck and neck with SoftBank, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had a webinar and they were gracious. Like, you know, I got to go to it as did all the JP Morgan clients. Um, 
and I got to hear from you know Chase Coleman, the the, the Tiger Global founders um, who were on that call. And they said some really some really interesting things. So you know, you, I think you were coming back to sort of like what is a company, and I'm I'm sort of like I have a master's in finance, right? So for me, I'm a complete. I like to call myself to my teams. I say I'm I'm a I'm a simple capitalist, meaning I don't understand roles or org charts or any of stuff. I just understand like where's the money. Mm-hmm. Tell me where the money is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, a, a company has only one job, really, which is return on equity maximization, right? Like we have equity in the company, we invested working, you know, capital, mm-hmm. and now we're going to deploy those in that. I mean, how do we deploy it efficiently to maximize the value of the company? You can do that by building moats or things that you know, building revenue, building free cash flow, building moats around that revenue and free cash flow or perception of moats. Um, and I think there was a there was a while, you know, when we look back twenty years ago in my dad's era of investing, where, you know, the biggest companies in the world, most valuable, were the ones that had oil, and now they're the companies that have data. Mm. Um, and how did that happen, and why did that happen? Right, like, why do Facebook and Google and you know these things work? It isn't because like Facebook is a cool app and everyone's excited about the app. Um, large scale long only, you know, $100 billion, trillion dollar you know, institutional investors and sovereign wealth funds don't invest in Facebook because the app is cool. Mm-hmm. Those people only and only and only care about one thing, which is free cash flow generation, right? And, you know, for all the flack around Meta and Oculus and it hasn't gone so well, um, I think Zuckerberg was putting $10 billion plus a year into this AR bet that as as yet hasn't had any uh, great <laughs> positive results from a revenue perspective. Um, and the street couldn't say anything to him. Mm-hmm. You know why that is? It's because he produces a hundred billion of free cash per year. <laughs> so he can launch 10 billion, but he can put 10 billion bucks and light it on fire mm-hmm. and the street can't say shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. So, um, when you're talking to Chase Coleman, these guys, the thing that they were saying, which is really interesting about like the businesses they invest in and the thesis, um, because they're hedge fund guys. So it's like, what the heck are these hedge fund guys, these serious, traditional, late stage public markets investors who are supposed to be like lo- talking like Warren Buffett. What the heck are they doing investing in Flipkart, which is the, you know, the Amazon of India, or, mm. like, you know, the, all these sort of speculative looking companies. And they had one, a really clear answer. And the really clear answer was they said, look, you know, I love Tesla. I have a Tesla, you know, like, I, you know, it's like I've got one in the garage. He's like, we, we invest in technology companies. Tesla is not a technology company. Mm. Tesla is a car company. Do they use technology in other wheels? Sure they do. What defines a technology company? What defines a technology company is a company that, you know, maybe spends $10 million a year to generate $2 million a year. And then it grows its revenue from $2 million to $5 million. And they're spending maybe $11 million a year. And then they grow their revenue from $5 million to $50 million. And they're spending $12 million a year. Because what happens is when you build a true technology company, you're able to support marginal revenue at no incremental cost, right? So if I get to, you know, $20 $20 million of revenue and I want to go to 200 or a billion or 2 billion or 10 billion or 20 billion, you can basically do it without adding any headcount, right? And there's giant private tech companies that people don't talk about. Do you know what the revenue of Craigslist is? <laughs> and the employee count, very low employee it's count. It's like 25 employees <laughs> and yeah. it does like 5 so, billion of free oh, cash it? flow, <laughs> right? And it's, it's, it's just like this. doesn't even look and how many people come in and say, let's redesign the site, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it's, and like, it's just people paying that stupid, like two bucks or five bucks yeah. or whatever per Craigslist ad. Yeah. And it is a monster. It's an absolute like cash monstrosity. Yeah. Um, so Tiger Global were saying like, you know, we get it. Like, cause they're, they, they're like tr- investor set are like endowments and pension plans and like major insurance companies and major. Yeah, they're thinking three generations in some three, cases. four generations. And then the, how do we get this traditional investor set to understand why we're doing this? And they're like, we're doing it not because the tech's cool. We're doing it because cash, <laughs> free cash flow is the goal. Mm-hmm. Right. And 
all technology, you know, should be oriented around free cash flow, right? Like if you're deploying, it, you know, technology in your business, there needs to be a very clear business case that this grows revenue, reduces costs, boosts income, or protects maybe future reduction of, you know. Sure. You know, people can do preventative things too is what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. Like make sure that this thing stays up and doesn't break. Yeah. But beyond that, like business cases have to be really, really, really clear. And I think there's too many things ha that happen because of with, you know, in all organizations and I'm very much to blame for this and it happens in my organizations as well, but without clear, concise, coherent business cases and finance cases to support them. Right. It's really simple. Everything is a tiny little profit and loss. If I got that leasing software, what is it costing me and what is it making me? Mm -hmm. Period. Sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or what is it saving me? Right. And the, the nice thing about, and I'll leave this because we're coming up on the end of time and I'd love yeah. to, obviously we'll have you back for more stuff in the future, but that the P&L management is what these operators get right. I mean, their, their job is that they're in the, they're in the P&L all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at technology, that's just another business case where you're, you're talking about that free cash. That's the purpose of this is to increase the revenue, cut the cost, which increases the net income. And um, so there, there's some, you know, if you're in finance and you're running P&Ls, you're well positioned to really think through this tech thing. But like to your point, going back to these wealthiest companies on the planet are data companies, right? So we have to ask. You know, where is our data? Who owns it? Yeah. What are we doing with it? How are we unlocking it? Yeah. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. And those are the partnerships we're working on right now is sort of saying like, hey, how do we get that data out of your system and turn it into a cash source? And I think it's like, I think everyone at a very high level knows that their data is probably worth something. Yeah. Um, but knowing that your data is worth something and being able to monetize that data are very different things, right? Like, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I, I've lived in 14 countries, by the way. I've lived in a lot of, a lot of the world, a um, lot of emerging countries, Africa and all these places. But one of the places I grew up was Saudi Arabia for some time. Mm. And Saudi Arabia, I mean, in the desert, they joke. Like, you literally, and I'm sure it does happen. You can, like, just stick a sand in the, you know, stick in the sand and out spritz, spritz oil. Yeah. Like, that's great. Like, oil, like, valuable, I'm sure, or like theoretically valuable, but like if it's just spraying in your face, <laughs> yeah, right, it isn't super valuable. You refine it, yeah. Uh, so you need to, you know, take it, capture it, structure it, store it, build a supply chain around, you know, refine it, make sure it's usable, it's the right grade, get it to, you know, uh, golf or sorry, I, Petro yeah. Canada or something, you know, sure. some, some re shell, get it to some retailer across the world who's like built a station, yeah. Um, so now the oil is worth something. Yeah. Um, so I think it's 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 in interesting, and what we found, you know, in our partnerships is that the majority of real estate operators have some concept that their data is worth something. Mm -hmm. But just because they think it's worth something doesn't mean that they have the wherewithal or necessarily, you know, they're yeah to be in all of the businesses that would make something from it. Right, and and that's where I think when I mentioned my analogy to the development process, they trust the structural engineer. Mm -hmm. They know, like, I need this building to go vertical, but I also know, like, I'm not going to go out and be a structural engineer. Yeah, it's We're going to bring in the consultant, right? So that's where you guys come in to help that refinement. We've already talked about how it unlocks the value, yep. turn that data into cash. But really, you need somebody that s understands that space and keeps up with that space because if they can't find people to be maintenance technicians or leasing agents or even VPs of tech, uh, property management... They're certainly not going to have <laughs> the the challenge of bringing in all the teams and disciplines and yeah understanding I mean, to to look, try and really unlock that type of value. Look, you can ask my wife as she looks at me and like other people, and I say it to you, and we all say it to each other: running a business is hard. Mm -hmm. Running your core business is hard enough, <laughs> you know. And if you have the wherewithal to right. Uh, run your core business and five non-core businesses, sure. Um, please teach me how. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't know how to yeah. do it. It's it's hard enough to bite off, you know, one problem to solve. Right. And there's all types of research on how that doesn't work <laughs> for people. Uh even in, yeah. in any 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 kind of you can't if you don't what if you don't focus on it, uh nothing gets done. Uh well well listen, we're coming up on the end of our time. What uh any final thoughts you want to leave our, our listeners with? Um 
nothing specific. Just thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, the great invigorating conversation. I'm glad I flew out here. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Thanks. it's great having you, and uh, we'll be tracking all your success. Yeah, well, our attempts. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Attempt. That's a good point. We'll leave that. Attempt something today. Yeah. That would be that would be fun to do. All right. Perfect. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you. All right.